The following program is made possible by the friends and partners of Time of Grace. You know, one of the interesting things that my generation of baby boomers did to our, our culture here in the United States is to kind of ac accentuate and accelerate a culture of youth that that's really where all the national attention goes. And we're so visual, so young people are in all the ads and commercials, and we're interested in young people's music. And the older you get, you kind of, first of all, are made to feel less important. And then just get out of the way, get out of sight. And they're kind of marginalized. That is not God's way. It's one thing to make young people feel like they have a place in the lights and in the agenda, but not at the expense of marginalizing older people and making the seniors feel useless, especially as they have increasing physical needs. Today, I'd like to invite you to dig into God's Word with me to show God's plan that Christians, God's people, care about their seniors. There's a, a powerful section of God's Word that I'd like to base this on in the book of 1 Timothy. If you have a Bible near you, would you please open it up to 1 Timothy chapter 5. St. Paul is writing, and Timothy is his young Paduan. He's the next gen coming up. In fact, he was so much younger than Paul, Paul had to write to him, don't let people blow off what you say because uh, they just say you're a kid. Do not let anyone despise you because of your youth. The truth is the truth, whether spoken by an older guy like me or a very young man like you. And Timothy was the next gen. He was Christianity 2.0. Paul brought the first wave, but you know, Paul was kind of like Johnny Appleseed. He traveled constantly on the move, spraying gospel seeds all over the place, but he rarely stayed in any one place longer than a month or two or three. But see, Timothy and Titus, his fellow uh, co-worker, and uh, Silas and, and Barnabas and some of the others, they were version 2.0. They stayed places, and after Paul had gotten a, a nucleus started, they then developed that group. They did the continual evangelism and the training and the Bible studies to bring depth. Paul was into breadth. They brought the depth of course, aided by the teachings that Paul had given to them. And these three letters in the New Testament, Timothy 1, Timothy 2, and Titus, are called the pastoral letters because they come from a pastor's heart, Pastor Paul, to a young pastor to show him how to do his pastor work. And right here in the first part of this chapter are some wonderful words of advice on how to build the right kind of relationships and set the tone and get the attitude right of how a congregation ought to be, how people should look at each other, how they should talk to each other within congregations. These are learned behaviors. We're also, by nature, also crabby and selfish and inward focused. These things have to be learned and consciously chosen because we always quickly gravitate towards self-centered behavior, viewing the church only as a club that I look at to see what can I get out of this for me, rather than how may God have set me up to be a servant to somebody else today. And our chapter begins in verse uh, 1 of chapter 5. Have you got the spot? First Timothy 5, verse 1. Paul writes to this younger man, Timothy. Paul says, don't rebuke an older man harshly but exhort him as if he were your dad. Isn't that kind of sweet? Think of your congregation as your family. These are relationships that matter. Show respect to the people who are older than you. You are benefiting from things that they did when you were a child or maybe before you even existed. Show respect to what they've achieved. Show respect to that gray and silver and white or non-existent hair. Show respect. If you have to straighten out an older man whose, whose ideas or belief system are somehow flawed or who has some habits or sinful actions, correct them gently, not harshly. Don't treat them like a senile idiot. 
Show respect. Imagine you're talking to your dad. You don't order your dad around. You don't badmouth your dad. Um, treat him as if he were your father. Treat younger men not as little jerks who are in your way. Treat them as brothers, like your younger brothers. Show respect to them too. Someday they're going to be changing your depends when you are old. Show respect. You're going to hand the baton off to them. You want to treat them like partners so that they will learn from you and listen to you. Younger people younger than you don't want to listen to you unless they feel respected. Isn't that true? If you treat somebody much younger than you as just a a little twit, a, a brainless twit, why should they listen to you? They're going to want to run in the opposite direction. So the church needs to promote this intergenerational communication of respect, and it starts with the leadership. Treat the older women as mothers, not as some old bags that you just, that their time has come and they're now, just get out of the way, Grandma, uh, you got nothing to give anymore. No, 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 no. Treat them with respect. It's like, imagine you're talking to your mom and treat the younger women as you would like a sister. Be extremely mindful, you male leader, of the younger women in the church because Satan is going to make sure that the unbelievers around congregations will assume you're all hypocrites and that they're just basically a one giant scam to help people find ways to manipulate and control other people. And as you well know, any kind of sexual impurity or scandal that touches the church is a double disaster. It not only hurts the individuals involved, but it, that bad name and that bad light gets shed on the entire organization. So man, be careful how you treat the younger women too. Give proper recognition to those widows who are really in need. And it's one of the most awesome things the churches did in the second wave, in that second generation. After they initially had been gathered around the word, now it was needed the training how to live your faith and caring for people who were personally struggling and in misery was something that churches really did well back then. In fact, we still can do it and are doing it and need to do better at that now. This is maybe something we don't quite take seriously enough because in the world we live in today, there is such an elaborate government safety net for social services that it seems like, well, who needs the church for that anymore? The government's doing all that. I'm being taxed and double taxed with Social Security to provide a safety net for people who even have nothing. If, if you're, you know, uh, senior citizens don't need uh, health care from, from me anymore. They don't need my money because they're on Medicare. You hit 65 and, and you're on the gravy train, right? Uh, and if you're too poor for it, uh, then you have Medicaid. And if, you, uh, if, if you're elderly and poor and you got no income, you go on SSI, which is which is a supplemental security income. Everybody can qualify for SSI. You just have to go demonstrate that your need is genuine. And if you're in a nursing home and you totally run out of money, they're not going to kick you out, right? You just apply for Title 19. Everybody knows the answer to that trick question, or you will, uh, as you get older, you will pay attention to that stuff. You declare bankruptcy, you go on Title 19, and life goes on. But these words are still true for you and me today. The elderly who are institutionalized are some of the loneliest people on the face of the earth. Do you believe me? If you've been in a nursing home, you'll be nodding right now. Maybe some of you have even spent a little time in some kind of institutionalized care as you are convalescing. And you see the long, dreary hours, how slow they drag by. But it's can be one of the loneliest places on the face of the earth. We need to pay attention to people who struggle. If a widow has children or grandchildren, these should learn, first of all, to put their religion, their faith into practice by caring for their own family and so repaying their parents and grandparents. We owe the people ahead of us. Their bodies may be frail, but we must never scorn someone whose body may be weaker than ours. That's just sin. Let's call it what it is, selfish sin. 
We owe the generations that have gone ahead of us their sacrifice, their labor, their saving, their patience, their toil have all made our lives immeasurably richer. Instead of despising them for being weak and frail and sick, they need respect and compassion. And who better to teach us that than Jesus himself, our Savior, the one who came to this earth to shed his blood to pay for our sins, also demonstrated that he came not just to teach and talk about religion, which of course he did, but he also spent many, many hours bringing the mercy of God with a touch to their lives and helping them, not only with their physical needs, you know, the healing miracles he did cannot even be counted. There were so many, the scriptures just allude briefly to the fact that he would spend hours at a time with a touch for every broken person who came. He cares about not just our souls, but our bodies too. But he cares also about people's lives. He helped Peter miraculously find the money he needed to pay the temple tax. He helped a miserable bridal couple not have their day ruined and their wedding supper had to close down early by mercifully extending their wedding banquet to the full time. He cares even about little stuff like that. What we would call little stuff. It was big to them, but we would call it little. He cares about that too. And if Jesus cares about people's personal and physical lives, if he acted like a servant to people, there's our, our inspiration, there's our modeling, there's our hero to do that in the same way and in this way repay our parents and our grandparents. What do you suppose God thinks of that? This is pleasing to God. You heard the story of Jesus' bitter scolding of the Pharisees who were neglecting their own elderly relatives with the excuse that, well, we're too busy, we're working for the church. We can't give them any financial support because we're giving our offerings to the church. It is korban, they said, an Aramaic word. for It's, it's a gift. It's, it's restricted funds. I can't, I can't give my Jesus money to take care of my parents. And they got a tongue lashing from Jesus. How dare you neglect your families? How dare you let these elderly relatives of yours struggle and struggle and twist in the wind when you have the time and the resources to ease their struggle? The widow who's really in need and left all alone puts her hope in God, continues night and day to pray and ask God for help. And we believers, we family members, we the church, are God's answer to the elderly who pray for help, who pray for a friend, who pray to be noticed, who pray to still feel like they have some worth, who pray to find value so that they can see their platform for still being in their ministry to the Lord. If a widow lives for pleasure, she's dead even while she lives. Give the people these instructions too so that no one may be open to blame. The, the way that congregations, people treat each other is what the world sees. The, the people who are still unbelievers are not dialed into the belief system yet. They're just looking at how you act. And our behaviors are all the Bible that some people will ever see. Jesus trained his disciples to think like that. In some of those precious few moments before he was arrested, he told his disciples the authentic badge of what would help people identify them as belonging to him. He said, people will know that you are my disciples if you... Well, thanks to the three of you who knew that <laughs> passage. I'm a, I'm a little... I uh, was expecting a little more robust assistance. You will not look like a religious gas bag, a poser, a fake if you love one another because nobody can fake genuine love. Unconditional love that doesn't seek to manipulate. I'm being nice to grandma not just so that she will give me her precious moments figurines. I'm taking grandpa to the doctor not just because I want his coin collection but unconditional love means you give service that no one knows. I want to give a big shout out to all of you who have spent time, maybe even right now, are spending time caring 
for elderly people. Most of that work is invisible. It's seen by no one. How many people actually notice the loving angels who will daily change the bed linens of an older person? Who will change the older person's depends? That's pretty private stuff, isn't it? Nobody sees but God and his angels who are clapping their wings for that kind of humble, tender service. Not too many people see when you cut the grass of an elderly person on your block just because, just because. Whether they're fellow Christians or not, you just do it just because, because it shows respect. When you cut short some personal time, you would like to go and party with your friends, but you say, nope, I haven't seen grandma in a while. I got to take a run over to grandma's and I'm going to spend time hanging out with her. Even though she maybe tells the same stories, even though she can't keep up with you and is not interested in what you're interested in, what an enormous way of showing respect. What an enormous way of paying off your debt to the people of your past. What a wonderful way of pleasing your God. We don't want the church to be open to blame of neglecting the older people. When we serve and care for the elderly, it sends a powerful message that our faith is real, that we're not just posers, that we mean it. If anyone, are you ready for this? This is, I'm coming to like, this is like my big main point here. So if the person next to you is a little droopy or, or seems distracted, Whack them in the ribs right now because this is important. If anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for his immediate family, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. At least a lot of unbelievers care for their elderly. I'll tell you what, in the Christian world, we better care for them all. And if you jump down to verse 16. Here's the the little finishing piece of that. If any woman who is a believer has widows in her family, she should help them and not let the church be burdened with them so the church can help those widows who are really in need. So being careful, not just manipulating a system, but personally investing in your family, taking care of your family so that they are cared for medically, that they're cared for physically, that they're secure and safe, so that they can eat. They bring such value to our lives. They help us to be rooted. The elderly know their time on earth is short. They've already got one eye already looking ahead. They're dialed in to the transition. They're really interested in spiritual things. The younger you are, the more you tend to ignore that and forget that. Everybody knows that Uh, One of the age demographics you will least likely find in church is that 18 to 25 age demographic because they're all caught up in the here and now. They're so busy now as adults in their lives. They're totally caught up in it, and they're not thinking ahead. Tell you what, when you're 85, you are looking ahead. You are thinking about my next transition, about the leap, and we need that messaging. We also need the continuity that the people who've gone before will hand on a legacy. And not just a financial legacy, or not just that they will their stuff and try to keep their household belongings in the family, that they pass on the spiritual legacy. As you well know, people don't self-convert. The gospel needs to be passed on. And what a great service is done in family evangelization as we serve and are served. As the younger generations serve the older ones physically, the older ones have so powerful a spiritual value and message to hand on. This is what's important. That message is more valuable than money. Here's what's important. Being dialed into your Savior Jesus gives you peace of mind that you get only through him. Believing in Jesus gives you confidence that God sooner or later, will meet all your needs in Christ Jesus. Here is a powerful message. No matter what disasters may come your way, with help from God, you can overcome them all. Let me tell you of what God has done for me in my life. Then, you, then the stories. If you slow down and listen, then the stories will come. 
If you're patient and you wait and you ask and you show interest, then the seniors will tell their stories and you'll realize how incredibly significant they are. One of the problems with this, one of the things we got to overcome, of course, is that when you're young and there's a grandpa or grandma, you've known them only in their senior years. And so grandpa always walked slow and grandma always had that limp. Hey, kid, there was a time when grandma didn't limp at all. In fact, she had blazing speed. There was a time when grandpa did not use that cane. In fact, there was a time when he could bench press hundreds of pounds. He was stronger than you. Hey, guess what? Grandpa's walking slow, but did you know he was a navigator in a B-17 and he flew 25 missions over northern Germany? Hey, it may look, uh, Grandma may look like she's moving kind of slow, but back in the day when the family had no job, she had a garden and canned everything that would grow so she could sustain the family through her incredible labor. They deserve our respect. And who better than the Christians to do that? For who loves them more than Jesus? And if Jesus loves them, who more than Jesus' people need to love and care for our seniors? So I know I have some work to do on this. I am not looking down my nose at you because of every sin of neglect you might be guilty. I am right there with you. But I need this encouragement that a Christian who neglects the older people in his or her family is, is denying the faith. This is, this is a strong talk, isn't it? This is a big deal. Pay attention to this. This is for you. You neglect the older ones in your family. You're denying your faith and you're worse than an unbeliever because you ought to know better. So today is my day to reload Today is a day I want to make sure I've got my attitudes right within myself, that I stop trash-talking myself for aging, that I make sure I am sending messages of appreciation and respect to the seniors in my life. And today is the day when I make sure that I, I make the time and I, I get involved in the, in the surrounding the seniors in my family and make sure they have what they need. To, to feel secure, to feel appreciated, and to feel part of God's continuing plan for they too have an important mission in God's overall mission. Are you in? If so, say, yep. <laughs> Amen. I would like to thank you for watching today and joining me. I hope that a little excursion in God's Word gives you some inspiration and some pep in your step that you feel powered up and more compassionate, more energetic, and wiser in your service to the Lord. Here's a question from a viewer that kind of rattled my cage a little bit and kind of puts a finger on a really tough dilemma for everybody in that middle generation. Do you think it's wrong for me to put my mom in a nursing home? She needs care, but I feel guilty about doing it and not taking care of her myself, even though I don't think I could do it. Well, that's an unanswerable question in and of itself, and there's no right or wrong to this answer. But boy, is that a dilemma that so many people have to go through, and I've gone through it myself, and I will have to again. What's at stake is what do you owe the seniors in your life? Do you need to quit your job in order to provide in-home care? That's not uh, an utter commandment. That's not something you are required to do. Some people choose to do it and they deserve immense respect and compassion. Some people just can't. They need the income. So what to do? I guess the, my general advice for that dilemma when that comes to be your time, that when you have to figure that out for your own parents, is first of all to try to keep your parents in their home as long as possible and to really familiarize yourself with all of the services that are around to enable people to stay in their homes as long as possible. But when the day comes that it's no longer possible to provide care, when, the, when your loved one is going to be a risk or danger to himself or herself, and the time comes when you need assisted living, to do it without fear or shame or guilt, and realize that this is going to be the next stage in that person's life. And then, 
when it becomes that stage in our lives that we are determined to make that transition cheerfully. Don't go away. I'm going to be back to pray with you in just a moment. What's your favorite excuse for not sharing your faith? I'm not a people person. I'm just not a people person. You know, I'm too old for this, and it really doesn't matter anymore. Hey, ever used one of these excuses? Oh, I'm too old, and it just doesn't matter. Just don't know how to do that. We all have. But no matter what you think of yourself, God has a plan for you. That's why we want to send you Pastor Jeske's new DVD study set called, I'm Not Dead Yet. You'll learn what God says about your mission in life, your value to Him, and the integral part you play in sharing Jesus' love with others. So contact us today. Text the word TIME to 313131. Call 800-661-3311 or visit timeofgrace.org slash store to request your copy. Your gifts help Time of Grace show others that they too have a God who loves and values them. I'd like to invite you to pray with me as we ponder the dilemmas of what happens when somebody in your family is aging and may or may not need health care. This is a hard one. There's no right and wrong. There are just a lot of difficult decisions where you have to balance risk and opportunities. What's good for the person, the person's comfort, the person's safety, your economic situation. And it causes a lot of guilt and misery in families. And let's pray for God's help, shall we, as we sort our way through these things. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we care about the seniors in our family. And as they're coming towards the end of their lives, as their strength and health are in decline, we pray for compassion and wisdom. We feel a lot of guilt about what level of care they may need and how much of our own lives do we need to invest in providing that care. Lord, guide us and shepherd us through this process. Help us to care, help all of us, especially our congregations, to care about our seniors, that their physical needs will be met, but also that their emotional and spiritual needs will be met as well. It's our thank you to them for all the value they've brought into our lives. It's our thank you for the sacrifices they have made to make our lives better. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. For Time of Grace, I'm Pastor Mark Jeske. Every day is a day of God's amazing grace for you. Helping you reach the next level of your Christian life is a driving passion for Mark Jeske and the ministry team at Time of Grace. When you visit timeofgrace.org, you'll find more resources than ever, including video extras, social media connections, new products, plus our prayer ministry, all at timeofgrace.org. And pray about becoming a Grace Partner, an exclusive group of partners and donors who are committed to help us expand Mark Jeske's teaching ministry around the world. Just call 1-800-661-3311 or visit us at timeofgrace.org. Thanks for watching and join us again next time for Mark Jeske and Time of Grace. The preceding program has been made possible by the friends and partners of Time of Grace.